Legrand Lockwood was an early adopter. Railroads, telegraph, indoor plumbing, gas, electricity, these may seem old tech to us, but they were new ones, and like new things today, not for everyone. Let me make a comparison. If Mr. Lockwood had been born 150 years later, he'd be one of those people standing in line at the Apple store waiting for an iPhone. He'd be an angel investor in tech firms. And, of course, he'd be on Twitter before any of his friends. Mr. Lockwood as an early adopter, and as a very early Twitter adopter, gives us pause. We like to think that we live in the most fast-changing of times. But in fact, it's very hard to know how to compare how rapidly the world is changing. What made the biggest changes in people's lives? The railroad, or electricity, or the telephone, or television, or the computer, or the internet? It's hard to know. And it's even more difficult to understand what people thought about it. In the exhibition, you can see the new technology. But what did people think about it when it was new? What did Mr. Lockwood, his friends and business associates, and others of his day think about the future? Why was he so taken with the latest new technologies, both for his home and for his investments? How did that change when his business failed? How has that changed over time? And so this evening, I want to take a very quick look at the future as seen from the past. What did Mr. Lockwood, and also his children and grandchildren, see when they looked ahead? More of the same? Constant change? Accelerating change? Did they look backwards with nostalgia, and maybe a fondness for the good old days, and forward with a fear of the unknown? Or did they imagine that things were getting better every day, in every way? That, in the great words of the song, the future so bright will have to wear shades. Let's go back to the 1830s and 1840s, when Legrand Lockwood was growing up. He was born in 1820 on a farm in Norwalk. What did he see when he was a teenager, when he was a young man? How quickly was the world changing then? And what did people think of it? Here's what he might have seen in 1836, when he was 16 years old and about to leave for New York City. He grew up on a farm, but this is a surprisingly industrial scene. Those clouds of smoke are coming from factories and from a steamboat, and they're there to advertise just how much Norwalk is part of the new technological revolution that is sweeping the country, and especially Connecticut. The artist who drew this picture was proud of just how modern Norwalk was, how quickly it was changing. That's why he emphasized the smoke. It meant new technology, progress, economic success. This was the era of the Industrial Revolution, and Connecticut was its home. Guns, clocks, pins are all being turned out by machines in enormous numbers. In 1820, when Lockwood was born, Connecticut was mostly rural. In 1850, almost 50,000 people worked in industrial establishments. Investors had invested some $23 million, perhaps a billion dollars in today's money, in Connecticut industry. Perhaps the most dramatic new technology was the railroad. In 1830, there were just 40 miles of railroad track in the U.S. By 1850, there were almost 9,000. More than half the value of stocks bought and sold involved railroads. The railroad involved a change, represented a change that's hard for us to imagine. In 1820, a trip from New York to Chicago would have taken three weeks. In 1860, it would have taken less than two days. Let's drop in on Norwalk again. This view is from just a few years later than the one I showed before, about 1850. Legrand would have been 30 years old. It looks bucolic, but look closer. That's a telegraph pole with wires that connected the town to New York City and soon to the entire world. The telegraph developed alongside the railroad. Samuel Morse built the first telegraph line from Washington to Baltimore in 1844. 
1850, the Bureau of the Census reported 75 telegraph companies with over 20,000 miles of wire. Again, an enormous investment by men with an optimistic sense of the future. To send a message from New York to, Ch from New York to Chicago in 1830 would have taken weeks. In 1860, instantaneous. And that's not all. By the 1860s, the telegraph connected New York with San Francisco and with London. Here's a map of 1857 of the telegraph lines in operation, under contract, and contemplated around the world. The triumph of the day was the Atlantic Cable, celebrated here in an 1858 drawing. So by the time Legrand reaches middle age, a success in New York City's financial world, he's seen remarkable change. When he was a boy, the speed of a fast horse was the fastest anyone could go. As an adult, fast trains of 60 miles an hour were not unheard of. A trip to Chicago, a week's long adventure in 1820, was a perfectly reasonable business trip. He would think nothing of sending a telegraph to London or to Paris. The phrase that people of the era used was the annihilation of time and space. That was made possible by men like Lockwood investing millions, tens of billions in today's my dollars, on grand technological projects that were unimaginable just a decade or two earlier. I think that Lockwood and the businessmen of his day were pretty optimistic about the future of technology. They put their money on new tech. Lockwood grew up at a time of remarkable technological change, not unlike our own. Maybe I would argue even more rapid and more disconcerting than our own. And he was just the right age to appreciate it, to jump on the bandwagon. Not everyone did. Let me compare Lockwood to two other men born at just about the same moment. First, let's consider Henry David Thoreau, born just three years before Legrand Lockwood. Thoreau, too, was part of this Industrial Revolution. He worked in his family's pencil factory in Concord, but he questioned the new technology. He warned that often with these modern improvements, there is an illusion about them. There is not always a positive advance. Our inventions, he wrote, are wont to be pretty toys which distract us from serious things. They are an improved means to an unimproved end. He was skeptical of the telegraph. We are in great haste to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas, but Maine and Texas, it may be, have nothing to communicate, as if the main object were to talk fast and not to talk sensibly. Next, let's look at Chauncey Thomas, born in Boston in 1820, the same year as Lockwood. Thomas became a carriage maker, and then the author of the Crystal Button, or the Adventures of Paul Prognosis in the 49th Century. Paul Prognosis sleeps for 3,000 years to awaken the Boston of 4872, where a combination of technological and concomitant moral advance has made for a world of universal peace and happy people. There are, as a review put it in 1891, flying machines and wonderful applications of electricity. So when Thoreau devoted his time to travel and writing, to questioning the rapid technological advance of his day, and Thomas to imagining a future where technology would solve America's social problems, Lockwood devoted himself to making money by investing in the new technology and by using it. His success in railroad seems to have encouraged him to bring the new technology home. And so, while we see in his house a very traditional exterior and some lovely interior furniture and art, there is some quite cutting-edge technologies, too. Lockwood's house was on the train line for easy travel to New York. He had a telegraph system at home so he could keep up with the stock market. The house was wired, not electric lights yet, but a call system, an astonishing burglar alarm system. There were two huge marine boilers in the basement to provide heat, boilers not too different from the boilers of a locomotive. There are call 
annunciators throughout, 23 bells connecting every room. There was hot and cold running water, gas lamps for every room. Lockwood liked the new technology, both at home and in, in his investments. He was part of the new breed of Wall Street tycoons that saw there was not only money to be made in being on the cutting edge of technology, but that it would make his life easier as well. He wasn't the only one taken with the new technology. Around this time, artists and writers began to imagine what might come next. Lockwood's lifetime saw railroads spanning the continent, the world wired with a telegraph. Who could imagine what happened next? Let's take a look at some of yesterday's tomorrows. What we'll see is that the future of transportation seemed bright and optimistic and fun, but that communications, well, people weren't so sure that it would work out so well. Consider this. This is The Steam Man of the Prairies, first published in 1866, just as the Transcontinental Railroad was conquering the West. The steam man soon found his way to more adventures in New York. Soon he was joined by a steam horse. When electricity came along, the steam horse was, alas, replaced by the electric horse, which, of course, led to further adventures. Airplanes, of course, were the ultimate in the future, and they have been for a long time. Here, airplanes from 1885 and from 1897. And my favorite, this is the history of transportation from the Amtrak station in Philadelphia from 1895. Its title is Transportation, and it shows both the history of transportation and its future, the airship. Here's another vision of transportation. Maybe we should, maybe we could look forward, like this gentleman, to being our own taxi cab with electric skates and a simple wireless arrangement that uses a natty umbrella to pick up power from the air. Steam men and electric horses and airplanes and maybe electric roller skates seem to bring unlimited promise. But other technologies, especially new machines that seem closer to what makes us human, they made people a little nervous. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote in the House of Seven Gables in 1851, by means of electricity, the world of matter has become a great nerve, vibrating thousands of miles in a pointless, in a breathless point of time. This prediction about the future of the telephone just a year after its invention in 1876, leaves one wondering a bit. It's quite wonderful that our orator can be heard around the world, but that tangle of wire makes me, and makes him, I think, a little bit nervous. And maybe that's for good reason. Let's take a look at somebody not too different from Mr. Lockwood, and maybe somebody a lot like ourselves. This is a bit later, this is 1903, a Charles Dana Gibson drawing. The caption reads, Mr. A. Merger Hogg is taking a few days much needed rest at his country home. There's the stock ticker, the equivalent of the Bloomberg terminal, and the typewriter and the telephone and the telegraph. There's no rest, no respite from business. Not that different, maybe, from all of us checking our email all day long. Lockwood probably felt the same day, same way, excuse me, technology everywhere. This very early adapter of the cell phone from 1908 raises similar questions. He doesn't look so thrilled. And I'm not sure this gentleman is either. We'll all be happy then, reads the caption from 1911. The opera delivered to your door, events as they transpire, a list of live video streams to choose from. It's the iPad, it's the internet. And even the robot butler on skates, who alas, we're still waiting for. On the other hand, there's the observoscope, letting us keep watch on everyone, and everyone keep a watch on us. Maybe it's be what makes us worried about this new communications information machines is something like this kind of fear. This machine records all your thoughts. 
information machines can get a little bit too close to us. Those are the questions we still think about. We wanted flying cars and robots, and we got the internet, TV, cameras watching us, and too many buttons to push on our automatic machines. But it doesn't matter because, like LeGrand Lockwood, we're spending our time tweeting, and that can be a pretty entertaining future, too. Thank you.